um, uh, short uh, vision of the team. We have uh, Gabriela Marseilla, Dr. Elisa Chiapponi, Fatma Yasmin Lumaki, Stefan Bushanan, and Dr. Ahmed El Simir. Um, few words about the association of cyber forensics and threat intelligence uh, investigation. So the association is professional, non-governmental, non-profit and public association. It was founded on an informal basis in 2016 in Santiago, Chile, and institutionalized later in 2020. The association aims to promote and support cybersecurity activities in compliance with applicable laws and to create a network for the exchanges of knowledge between specialists in academic and corporate environment. Uh, the association is also involved in international joint research projects such as the Cost Action CA1712 for Digital Forensics via Intelligence System. Additionally, it is involved in training programs that are aimed at increasing technical skills among young professionals in a wide scope of cybersecurity and cyber forensics field. The association aims to inspire the next generation of underrepresented groups by creating a learning community of students, professors, and industry professionals. It connects you to cybersecurity practitioners on campus with leading professionals through meaningful engagement and practical guidance. So here we can see the vision of the association. We have both research, software development, education, but as well prevention, detection, and response, all in the same picture. Uh, let's now talk about the collaboration opportunity. Um, the association encourages members to volunteer their time to give back to their community where there is a need for their expertise. To the end, SCFTI is in particular interested in organizations that would be willing to sponsor our initiative and offer paid or unpaid internship in cybersecurity. The association is also continuously looking at partnership with organizations offering uh, um, training to create opportunities for our members to gain hands-on expertise in their field before graduation. And the areas requiring, requiring volunteer include involvement in organizing participation in summits, workshops, conferences, journals, and open science venues affiliated with the association. We also need volunteers to aid in development of open uh, source DFRI tools. So if you're interested, feel free to uh, contact us. Uh, now I would like to show you the new uh, website for the DFR stream. Um, we have a website in which you can find all the um, next uh, talks, but also the recording of the previous one, if you had missed one. And also you find there the uh, form to uh, for applying for the next DFR uh, session or to nominate someone that you think would be suitable to give a talk in this uh, community. I would also to remind you the um, call for paper for our uh, workshop, the IEEE -S CSR workshop on cyber forensics and advanced threat investigation in emerging technologies that will take place in September. The paper submission uh, will last uh, a bit less than one month. The deadline date is June 3rd. So I hope uh, that uh, you will consider submitting your uh, work uh, in this venue. And I will provide as well in the chat the link uh, for uh, this, so you can directly go there. And now let's uh, introduce uh, the speaker of today, um, Dr. Chen Liu from Clarkson University. Thank you for being here today. Uh, uh, Dr. Chen Liu is currently an associate professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Clarkson University, Boston, New York. He received his Bachelor in Electronics and Information Engineering in 2000 from the University of Science and Technology of China, the master uh, degree in electrical engineering in 2002 from the University of California, Riverside, and his PhD in electrical and computer engineering in 2008 from the University of California, Irvine. From 2008 to 2012, Dr. Liu was an assistant professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Florida International University. His research has been focused on the interaction between hardware and system software, especially low-level hardware information to model the software behavior. Dr. Liu is a senior member of IEEE and ACM, is also a member of IEEE Computer Society, ACM SIGARG and ACM SIGMICRO. And today he will uh, give us a talk that is titled Low-Level Hardware Information Assisted Approach Towards System Security. I remind you that you can write your uh, questions in the chat and then the, we will read them out loud and uh, 
Dr. Uh, Liu uh, will uh, answer them. So without further ado, I leave you the floor to uh, Dr. Chen Liu for his talk. All right, thank you very much, Alisa, for the introduction. Uh, I just want to check, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Do you have any issue sharing the slides or? Yes. Um, it says that, uh, oh yeah. Hopefully this will work. Okay. Okay. Um, it seems I need to quit Chrome and rejoin. So um, is that okay? Just I rejoin. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I think I added you as a co-host. Maybe you can try to reshare again. Let me see. But it says a uh, um, Google Chrome settings give me trouble. I think. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll. I think it's best I quit and rejoin. So, just okay, I'll be right back. Thank you. I'm back, so hopefully this time it will work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can see your screen. Right. Let me see. How about yes. this? Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so sorry about the technical difficulty. Um, again, uh, I'm, I'm very appreciative this opportunity to be able to speak at uh, SAFTI cybersecurity stream. Um, so um, a little bit about uh, Clarkson University. We are located in upstate New York, 
in in the uh, in U.S. and uh, uh, we're in a small town called Potsdam. So uh, for the uh, European audience, so the the Potsdam in Germany is more, more much more famous. So we are uh, the, I think we are the second place that called Potsdam. So and we are very close to the Canadian border from the U.S. side. Uh, so, and as you can see, we can get very cold in the winter. And uh, uh, so the university actually is founded in 1896. And, and um, uh, currently our, our total enrollment is around 4,000 students and about 400 is uh, a graduate student and about 3,600 is undergrads. And uh, so Clarkson University is a private national research university, so which we offer degrees from bachelor's to master's and uh, as well as PhD. Oh, so then uh, today's topic actually is uh, on cybersecurity. So then, uh, you know, whenever we talk about these uh, 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 topics, then uh, um, we always need to discuss, or we, we always have a uh, impact slides, right? So like, what what are we dealing with here? So um, then uh, uh, there's multiple studies on the impact of uh, uh, cyber crimes related to the uh, uh, like global GDP. And so then uh, in an earlier study by McAfee that they basically mentioned, you know, uh, they are estimated a cyber crime cost for is about $1 trillion, right? And that's about 1% of the global GDP, right? However, then uh, uh, then there's a newer study mentioned that, okay, McAfee maybe underestimated the, the, uh, uh, the impact of uh, cost of cyber crime. So that now, based on another study by I uh, Cybersecurity Ventures, it basically said, you know, the cyber crime damage cost will be uh, is around six trillion US dollars so, for a year. And then, uh, uh, yet there is another study basically showing, okay, that there is a, a fifteen percent increase every year on the impact of cyber crime to the world. So then, by twenty twenty five, then we're basically the cost is at ten point five trillion US dollars. So that basically means uh, 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 the impact of cyber crimes, right? Because we are more and more living in the in in a, in a cyber based world, right? And uh, so then. Uh, for us, right? So this topic, then we narrow down a little bit. Okay? We narrow down a little bit, then we mainly discussing uh, like uh, uh, malware. Okay, we try to detect malware. So malware plays a you know plays a role in uh, in the cyber crimes, and then we dealing with actually one of the top one uh, malware scenarios uh, that is actually is ransomware. Okay, so and. Um, then uh, before that, okay, let's uh, discuss that uh, from a from a hardware architecture point of view. Like, what are we dealing with here, right? So this is a traditional. Uh, this is a, a, a traditional uh, uh, graph, like describe the interaction, okay, between software and hardware. Right. So what you do is normally you have a computer, right? So you're running a program X, Y, Z, then uh, through the operating system running it on hardware, right? And normally this is only a one way. Uh, information flow because if you think about that is uh, you like uh, um, you compile a program right you generate binary and then the operating system system will schedule your process uh, schedule a program as a process right and onto the hardware then it's being executed so then uh, in this way right that's what that, so basically they're like there's there's no information flow back okay so the program just executed as a black box from an operating system point of view Right, and then the only thing operating system does from a scheduler point of view is uh, okay. It look at oh how many cores I have, then how many process I have, then I just find the empty core that is scheduling, then uh, to uh, to to run uh, to run uh, the process that we in the queue. Right, that's normally the case. However, in what we do, okay, and we want to promote uh, two way information flow. All right, so which means uh, that. Uh, we don't want to execute the program as a black box, okay? In, with, uh, but we want to encourage some information kind of flow back to the software level, because this can provide us with a lot of benefit, improving, including improved performance, right? And the perform energy aware computing and uh, uh, in cloud computing and the security, right? However, how can that can, how can that be done? All right, and uh, is uh, there we are going to utilize one unique feature from hardware level that's called a performance monitoring counters pnc all right so then uh the outline of today's talk is i'm going to talk about three topics okay three to 
topics is all related to what I have just mentioned. Is uh, uh, we want to use the the low level information from the hardware and then using that to help us with the the uh, the security of the system, right? Uh, but uh, before we do that, okay, before we do that, then the first topic uh, uh, is that uh, we want to introduce a way that we we can collect this kind of hardware information, okay? So uh, then for the performance performance monitoring country, they are built into modern processors, right? And uh, uh, then using these performance counter values, okay, we can you know do uh, we can perform malware detection, scheduling, and uh, dynamic power estimation as well as uh, system performance optimization, right? Uh, however, there are we are not the first group to looking at right how do we collect uh, hardware performance uh, level counters to use that to our to, to our advantage okay there is uh, many tools have been developed to provide a, a high level apis to um, access these uh, low level performance counters right including perf which is building to the linux kernel okay and then including poppy and uh, as well as limit all right so now however these tools they all have their own limitation for example like uh, uh, perf tool is very commonly used, but uh, the timer granularity is kind of limited because they cannot go lower than uh, 10 milliseconds, right? And then Poppy uh, is, uh, and also perf and Poppy, they have uh, their performance overhead is kind of uh, is kind of high. And then for Poppy and Limit, then requ they require source code instrumentation, okay, which is uh, quite can require either a uh, deep knowledge of the source code itself and a second can be intrusive by nature right so uh, and the last one limited uh, 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 is uh, also require a kernel patch in order to you to be functional all right which you can be which you can be quite intimidating right because you need to patch the kernel before you can apply this right? so what we look at right so before we jump into the malware detection so what we want is okay we need a better tool can a better tool can help us collect hardware level information. So that's why we introduced Kalo. Okay. Uh, so it's called a kernel lineage of event behavior. So in short, Kalo. Right. And then uh, what what we want is we want Kalo to be able to provide the hardware level information in a fashion of precise, non-intrusive, low overhead and a high periodicity, okay? So that is our target. We want to use this to be able to, we want all these benefit in this tool we developed so that we can get better performance hardware level information because once we have that, because you can imagine that will greatly benefit us than uh, uh, when we when it comes to uh, uh, malware detection, okay? So which is the second part of my talk. So, now this is uh, the uh, 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 the system model of Caleb, right? So now that uh, we divide into user space and kernel space, okay? So um, the um, the then there's a controller process which controls the kernel module from the user space, all right? And uh, this including like start and stop the collecting and then initialize the kernel module and everything, right? And uh, then the kernel module is in, is on the kernel space, right? And uh, it basically access uh, PMU, okay? So PMU stands for Performance Monitoring Unit, okay? Performance Monitoring Unit, and then uh, it's, it's a special hardware register used to monitor hardware events. And uh, then the performance monitoring counters actually is inside PMU, okay? So that's what we're looking at. And uh, um, so kernel modules will go to PMU, then accessing the these special registers to get to the hardware, uh, um, hardware uh, level information. Okay, uh, and then uh, lastly, the monitor process is uh, that the one you you are interested in. Okay, so the process can be uh, you know a program, right? And uh, also, uh, in addition to individual pro uh, program, we can monitor. We can even perform a system level monitor. So that's a basic two different monitoring scenarios. All right. So 
Then the process flow, or basically, is we divide into five phases. Okay, this including since it's a kernel module, right? So you need to to uh uh, uh you, so uh, so it, uh, you need to initialize it. So there's includes so the first phase is module initialization. As you can see, this divided into kernel space and user space. Okay, so then uh, once the kernel module is uh is uh initialized, then we'll start monitoring. All right, we'll start monitoring. Then um. Then uh, uh, once the process is done, we'll start monitoring. Then we'll do the uh, perform the deinitialization of the module, and then uh, and then we log in the result out. Okay, so so now the thing is uh, when we look at the process, okay, from a in, uh, from a Linux scheduler point of view, what will happen is uh, that a process will be scheduled in and scheduled out. Okay. During its uh, do, uh, during its running uh, running time, all right. And so then, uh, since uh, what we want is uh, we want to collect the um, hardware behavior of the uh, of the specific process. Okay, as you can imagine, that uh, the natural thing for us to do is uh, we should start counting uh, or collecting hardware performance counter data while the process is scheduled in, right? And then we should stop counting then while 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 the process is scheduled out. All right. So then, in this, this basically uh, continues. So now the uh, x axis is time here, and the red line indicating the the process that we're monitoring, right, got scheduled in and gets scheduled out, right. And then the blue uh, blue line basically indicating Caleb. So that is so. So then the blue line basically is looking at you know the five different phases of Caleb while uh, while we're monitoring the. Uh, uh, monitoring the uh, the specific process. Okay, so uh, that as you can see that uh, it basically uh, scheduled in and out only the the counting only triggered when the the process is scheduled in and out. So as you can see uh, that can be done actually by by just monitoring the process ID. Okay, at the wrong time. Um, so then. Uh, um, we so we want to we want to test it out. Okay, we want to see okay how the how the uh, the kernel module actually uh, work. All right, and uh, uh, so then we basically tested on a local computer, right? A call Intel Core i7 uh, 920 at uh, 2.67 gigahertz, and then we also tested a uh, 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 Intel Xeon Plantium A259CL. Processor on uh, using the uh, Amazon Web Service. Okay, so then we tested three different scenarios. Okay, Lean Plant, Docker, and Meltdown. So the first case is Lean Pack. Okay, Lean Pack is a uh, Lean Pack is a uh, uh, very famous and widely used uh, benchmarking tool. Okay, for scientific computations. All right. And uh, uh, it's involved a lot of matrix uh, 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 operations, okay. So which is quite data intensive. That's why people use impact as a, as a benchmark, all right. And then what we did is we so as you can see we mounted the three hardware events here, uh, a load, store, and uh, arithmetic multiply, all right. And uh, so what happened is uh, uh, we can see right. We can clearly see the key, Phase behavior of the link pack program based on the hardware. Event. That. Okay. So then we can see, like at the beginning, of course, you have a initialization phase, right? So we should perform a lot, a lot of load store instruction, but we're not doing any computations, okay? And then we when when we begin, right? We you can see a clear phase for computation, right? Clear phase for computation, and then you do a lot of load and the computation, but you are you are not doing too much stores, right? And then once you finish that phase, you can see that you know we need to put the result back, and. Uh, so that that's when you have a, a a rise of the load instructions, but a decrease on the computations. Okay, 
And uh, then uh, this basically this phase continues. Okay, this phase continues. So then we have another computation phase, and then we have another uh, uh, store phase, right? So this is normally how your your, your scientific program is is run, right? But as you can see that uh, uh, using Caleb, we can clearly see capture the phase behavior of the program, right? And then we also look at okay by running Caleb, what's the overhead, right? What's the overhead uh, impact on the on impact program itself? Then we say okay, there's a very small uh, floating point operation losses. Uh, 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 we measured, which is at uh, 0.64 percent. Okay, compared with we do a similar thing with Linux Perf, the overhead is 7.08. Okay, so that uh, you can see we have a much lower overhead, even what, even though we we basically capturing the same thing with other uh, tools. All right. So then the second example we can look at is Docker, right? So Docker is also quite popular nowadays. People use as a container, right, to run their programs. And uh, uh, so now the thing is, uh, can we, uh, so what we say is, can we monitoring Docker? Okay. Can we monitoring Docker then from outside Docker? Okay. And then, uh, so then to perform a workload char characterization, right? So then in this case, what we did is, okay, we run, we run different Docker images, okay? We run different Docker images, then we collect two things. We collect their last level cache miss, okay? Last level cache miss. And also we, we, we collect the number of instructions executed, right? So we collect those two numbers and then we divide them, then we get a, we get a metric called a, a MPKI, which, which is a misses per kilo instructions. All right. So then, using MP, MPKI, we can use that to indicate, okay, the program's behavior is uh, uh, loosely. We can loosely char characterize uh, the program is computation intensive or memory intensive, right? So as you can see, that uh, when MPKI is kind of low, right, or very low in this case, right, and then they they are more on the computation intensive or side, okay, and uh, then. Uh, then uh, uh, for these wild uh, Docker images in the middle, right, they kind of have medium, medium uh, uh, computation requirement, all right? But uh, 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 then for the one on the right, which has a very high misses per kilo instruction, as you can see that they put a very heavy load on the memory system, all right? That's it. So basically, we can use this to, uh, uh, to uh, characterize the workload, in this case, Docker, and then uh, uh, and uh, which is a behavior is not intrusive to the running program because we don't need to know what you're running, all right? We don't need to what you're running. We're just monitoring the, the, the Docker container itself as a whole, right? And then, uh, so in this way, you can see it benefit because uh, uh, it benefits me because from a, from a scheduling point of view, I can, I can basically manipulate uh, uh, the Docker images based on their behavior at the wrong time. Right, and then uh, so uh, on a common approach is I can pair a computation intensive uh, container with a memory intensive container. So in that way, they kind of complement each other in terms of their their demand on the software, right? Uh, on the hardware resources. So in that way, they overall they can have better performance and pursue it. Okay. So then uh, uh, this is uh, the the example we're running on the AWS machine, right? So then we can see the uh, the program still follow the similar trend. Okay. Uh, so, like uh, these kind of web servers uh, have much high, much higher demand on the memory system, right? But uh, for 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 programs like Ruby, uh, then they have very low demand on the on the memory system. So, the 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 third study is uh, we're looking at uh, 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 the one of the most famous uh, side channel attacks called uh, meltdown, right? And then we say, okay, can we detect a meltdown, right? So then, uh, um, so we basically collected. Uh, 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 the uh, two two numbers. Okay, we collect two numbers. One is last level cache miss, right? And uh, then uh, we also collected last level cache uh, uh, access number of last last level cache access. So then, uh, then we divide them. We can get a ratio. Okay, we can get a ratio, which is a, a, a miss over reference ratio. Okay, so. Then, because of the nature of meltdown, right, which will require a very high access to the to, to because it's kind of uh, 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 scanning every single line of your memory system, right? Because the side side channel attack that using the timing in for 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 cache uh, uh, hit and uh, miss, right? Using that to infer the content 
of the uh, 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 of the cash line. So that's why, as you can see, that um, there uh, for the um, for for the meltdown, the cash uh, you have a lot of ones, which means uh, you, have, you almost every uh, every single reference you have is a miss, right? So that's basically indicating what what it does is basically it's a it's a scanning through and. Uh, uh, evicting every single line of the cache, right? And uh, which is quite irregular compared to your regular behavior, which is shooting blue here, right? If you're shooting blue here, it's non meltdown behavior. That's kind of what you expect, right? You don't evict your, your memory like that. So unless you are doing this kind of attacks. So, uh, and then, uh, but this example basically showing you, you another uh, benefit of uh, um, Caleb, which is uh, we can using, uh, we, we basically operate on high frequency timer. So we, in, uh, so, for example, we can operate at uh, uh, um, one millisecond or even 0.1 millisecond range, all right? And then uh, compare with uh, 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 a traditional timer from Perf, if they, they operate at 10 milliseconds, right? So that's why you can see in this example, we can collect like, you know, more than 80 samples. This is only for like 10 milliseconds. If you think about that, if you're using Perf, you have 10 millisecond granularity, this whole thing only gives you one sample. Right. However, because we can overcome that uh, uh, timer constraint by employing high frequency timers operating at 100 micro uh, uh, microsecond, right? Now we basically can collect 100 samples in the same period of time. When you have 100 samples, you can describe the behavior, right? When you only have one sample, you won't be able to. So this is another example that we showed that using Caleb, we can perform anomaly detection, okay? And um, especially the program with short execution time. So now uh, we compared, or then we did an overhead study. Okay, so how much overhead Caleb compared with other references, including perf, puppy limit, right? And then at a different sampling rate, 10 millisecond, one millisecond, and 0.1 millisecond. As you can see, uh, that uh, Caleb, uh, the uh, performance overhead is at uh, you know 0.68%. Okay, 0.68% compared with perf and puppy and limit, right? And this applies to different sample rate as well. So uh, con consistently that Caleb has uh, the lowest overhead because put that in the context, you know, anytime you perform, you collect the information, right? There will be overhead on your real work, on the workload that you're running, right? So that's why you want your overhead, uh, naturally you want your overhead as much as possible and then Caleb just be, be able to do that, all right? And then uh, this is uh, the, the, the uh, uh, normal at the execution time, which means, <clears throat> okay, block. Uh, this is a block and whisker graph, right? So then uh, uh, the, we want to get close to to no HPC as possible. Basically, basically means uh, that that's the native running environment, which means we are not collecting performance content numbers, right? And then everything else is we are collecting performance content numbers. So we want to be as low as possible. So. Uh, using this Bosch and whisker graph, so that's why you can see Caleb, which is uh, the second to the left, that is uh, consistently has low, less spread in SQL across all, all comparable tools. So uh, that's another indication that uh, um, it has low overhead. And then uh, we, 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 so our overhead is low, so then we also want to show like, uh, um, uh, how close our readings, right, compare with other tools. So because uh, uh, you can be fast, but you also want to be accurate. So then we, when we play it, compare to other tools, that's this is the other difference, okay? There's a difference in terms of the different hardware events counts we collected and uh, in percentage, okay, in percentage. And then uh, you can see many of these in, in, uh, in are 10 to the power minus four, 10 to the power minus five, 10 to the power minus three, right? And uh, so that basically means that there is very little difference with what we collected with other tools, which means uh, the collection mechanism also works as it's supposed to be. So, uh, so the here is a summary of this piece of work that uh, we basically introduced a uh, kind of a kernel module based approach for performance counter collection. Uh, uh, and then it's non intrusive to the program being monitored, and uh, it can provide high frequency sampling up to 100 microsecond, right? Which is 100 times faster than the current available tools. And then uh, it also has very low and negligible overhead, right? So now 
move on to the second topic of today, which is uh, now we have this tool, right? So we want to use that tool to advantage. So this is uh, uh, we want to introduce a lightweight hardware anomaly real time detection framework targeting ransomware. Okay, so ransomware nowadays uh, is is actually is uh, the uh, the the top one uh, malware attack that that is uh, cause a lot of damage, right? So now the question, so basically is because of this number, that's why we we pick ransomware. Okay, that's why I pick ransomware because uh, that's uh, the so since uh, since it does so much damage that we want to detect it. Okay, so. And uh, uh, then uh, there's uh, so detect uh, ransomware, right? So one is signature based. There are some, some existing approach including signature based, uh, network analysis based, and the data behavior analysis, uh, analysis based, right? So signature based is a traditional way, right? But the thing is, uh, signature based you kind of need the signature in the first place, which means you cannot detect something you don't have a signature, right? So network analysis is mainly monitoring the network traffic, okay? And uh, uh, then. Uh, uh, data behavior analysis is uh, uh, to detect the uh, data change or file generated by ransomware. Okay, so then uh, what we observed is uh, these uh, different uh, attack uh, detection um, approach should be deployed in conjunction with each other. Okay, so now what we propose is uh, a hardware anomaly real time detection called uh, uh, a lightweight called hard light. Okay, so then uh, the hard light. Uh, composed of two modules, okay, data collection module uh, and uh, classification module, okay. So, uh, so now for the data collection module, right, that's where we can see that what we use, apparently we use Caleb, all right. So based on all the benefit I just described, then we use Caleb to, uh, to, to monitor, to, to basically collect the hardware level information, all right. And uh, uh, then, uh, but however, the thing is, uh, uh, we need to select. Okay, what are the hardware events we uh, we can we we need to select in order to monitor um, ransomware, right? So we did a study. We did a study. So in this case, we use different hardware events. Then we say, okay, which one of these hardware events then is best at detecting ransomware? And then eventually, these are uh, the top four. The, the the top four basically uh, is what I highlight here. All right. So the reason why they, we select a fork okay, because of what we want is we want to perform real time monitoring of the system. Okay, real time monitoring. However, the what a microprocessor does is it only give you limited number of hardware events you can monitor at runtime. Basically, the configuration, for example, the common configuration for Intel processor is four plus three. You can uh, pro you can you, you can monitor four programmable hardware events, and you have then there are three system default uh, pro, uh, hardware events, including number of instructions, number of clock cycles, etc. Right. So that's why we select four here because we can only at most monitor four at the same time at runtime. Okay. So we pick the top four, and then uh, right, and uh, then another one actually then. Uh, in, uh, so um, in the classification module, right? Then we use semi supervised normal detection. Okay, so it's a f there's five kind of here because uh, we used uh, four from previous one. We also uh, used uh, the the number of instructions as well. So which is a system default. So that's why it's five. And then uh, we use the semi supervised uh, uh, normal detection. The reason is uh, uh, we only use the benign data. Okay, we only use the benign data. We're doing the training process, which means that uh, uh, we didn't use any malicious behavior from the ransomware during our training. We only use the benign behavior in our training, and we use that uh, to detect ransomware. So that's why the whole thing is semi uh, semi supervised anomaly detection. Okay. So uh, so then uh, the user experiment setup is uh, we perform an experiment on user machines right with regular workload. Then we deploy the uh, data collection module, okay, uh, on the user machine to collect the hard information. Then we send this. Uh, then we deploy the classification module, okay, and uh, uh, on a different machine, okay, and then we to to classify uh, as a classifier machine, right? And then uh, to see how it works, we deploy the ransomware on the user machine, then to see if we can detect it or not. So. Uh, this is uh, the, the we use the LSTM classifier. Okay, so as you can see, 
uh, this is the benign case, right? Benign case, the red line is a threshold, so that you can see most of the cases, uh, 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 the, the benign behavior is below threshold, right? There's some, a few cases above, but most of the cases are below, below threshold. However, when it's a ransomware case, as you can see for these different hardware events, right? And uh, uh, then the ma majority of them, they are above threshold, right? So that's basically indicating that there's a difference in their behavior. That's how we can classify them, right? And uh, however, uh, 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 then we don't. We can not just using the raw numbers, right? And because then then it will be too many false positives. So that what we did is we use the WMV. We use the weighted majority vote. Okay, we use the weighted majority vote. That basically means uh, just one performance counter saying it's normal is uh, normal is not enough. So we need a we need a majority of the but the the the, the counter saying it's, it's normal. Then we say it's normal, right? So that that's why you can see after the majority vote we significantly reduce the number of false positives. Okay, and uh, uh, and then uh, so after WMV, then we also did uh, a EMA. We also did exponential moving average. Okay, so by doing exponential moving average, then we can we can further reduce the false positive and negatives because uh, uh, we apply a low filter that reduce the high frequency noise. So those uh, 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 those random false positive and negative will be filtered out, filtered out. So. Uh, as you can see in this case, that uh, the the crypto sky is one of the ransomware's behavior is to quickly go rise above the threshold and stays there, so that uh, we don't have false positives afterwards. Right. So now this uh, uh, this graph shows you okay how long does it us take to detect a ransomware? Okay. So then we test the different ransomware, right? So then when the uh, uh, when the first time that uh, the behavior is over the threshold and we find a warning. That's my our first warning. Okay. So as you can see on average, our first warning takes 2.264 seconds okay, to generate. But when there is a multiple warnings being generated, then we are pretty sure it is you're being attacked, we generate the second flag, which is a normally flag. All right. And then on average, as you can see, that our average uh, 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 it's a 3.726 second for us to generate the second flag second flag okay so which is uh, uh, uh which we know we did everything in real time okay, we did everything in real time and uh so uh, overall the uh, uh this this time frame is pretty quick because considering the, the what the ransom trying to do is you try to for example cut encrypting entire hard disk which normally will take hours uh to do and then we can detect it in first two three seconds which is quite efficient so uh, then, uh, uh, because we're running the classification module, right? So in this case, then to avoid uh, uh, interfere with the user machine, then basically we're offloading the classification module to the server machine, and uh, so that because the server machine can running can be running the more the the, the heavyweight uh, machine learning algorithm, right? And then uh, then. Uh, uh, so then it will have very little impact on the user machine. The user machine can be uh, can still uh, uh, running uh, focus on running the user workload, right? And also another benefit is that the classifying machine can monitor multiple user machines at the same time, okay? Because you can re so each user machine has running a classifier, so then different you 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 can you can have diff multiple uh, classifier running at the same time, right? Monitoring different user machines. So we think that is a advantage. And uh, so overall, that uh, we introduced uh, a hard light. Uh, uh, a lightweight framework for real-time ransomware detection. And uh, um, so it uses the low-level hardware information for anomaly detection that can detect uh, multiple ransomware families. And uh, um, it, uh, uh, it also has fast detection time with a uh, lightweight de deployment. Okay. So uh, very quickly, the last uh, piece of work we did is to compare uh, uh, one class to versus two class module for ransomware detection. Right. Uh, so we still perform the, we still use the same framework. Okay. We still use the same framework using Caleb then to perform uh, uh, the uh, to perform the the, 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 the system man level monitoring, right? And then we're using one class or two. Previous work we use one class module, which means we only train on the benign behavior, right? But uh, in this case, we also introduced the two class module. Okay, in two class module, we train on both users uh, on both benign behavior 
as well as a behavior that you are being attacked by ransomware. All right. So then we did a comparison. Uh, uh, so uh, so then uh, here is the one class LSTM model. We use the LSTM auto encoder, uh, auto encoder, and then uh, for uh, for for uh, two class LSTM module. And we use the LSTM category, uh, category called gross entropy. And uh, then this is a comparison, OK? This is a comparison. One class module compared with two class modules. As you can see, that uh, um, apparently benign at uh, uh, apparently that uh, uh, two class module has a much higher uh, uh, detection accuracy than the one class module, OK? And then even, even under, uh, even under uh, a stress plus encryption, because uh, um, one difficulty for, for malware detection is uh, that um, malware try to encrypt your hard disk, right? And then uh, uh, the thing is uh, your normal encryption algorithm also try to do encrypt work, right? So, but your normal encryption work is, is normal, is benign behavior, but uh, whenever your, your, your ransomware try to encrypt your hard disk, that becomes uh, malicious, right? How do, you, how do you differentiate these two is a challenge, that's why for, for one class, you can see it doesn't perform well that well when you, you add the encryption workload. But uh, with two class uh, models, you can see even with encryption, you we still can achieve very high uh, detection accuracy. So, um, so, that, so that's why the, there is a limit to the one class module prone to false positive cases and uh, difficult to draw boundaries between benign and malicious cases, while two class module can help us uh, to overcome that difficulty, okay. Uh, so then, uh, um, so uh, I just want to mention these slides real quick. So in these slides, what we did is we continuously removing the training fa families ransomware, okay, which is, uh, you know, in 12 means we used all 12 ransomware family in the training of our two class module, all right? And then we gradually remove one family uh, at a time until there is no family we used in the training that basically come back to our one class case. Okay, come back to our one class case, which means only use the benign behavior for training. So as you can see, for one class module, which is at the bottom, we use the zero ransomware family for the training, our accuracy is 89%, right? But uh, then uh, when we're using two class modules, you can see, right? So actually, even until to five families, we're pretty good. We're still at 97% above, right? Only when we go down to four families that we our performance go drops to, to 91%. And only when we down to two families, our performance is worse than the one class module. All right. So that basically indicating, you know, as long as we could have some knowledges uh, of the ransomware, right? And that will be able to help us build a two-class module to detect the ransomware that even we didn't use in the training, which means even we haven't seen before, okay? So, uh, so the, now in conclusion, right? So in this talk, uh, with malware, uh, we're basically focusing on using low-level hardware information plus machine learning towards malware detection, right? And uh, using this type of approaches allows us to be better to or measure performance and behavioral characteristics of programs, in this case, even systems, all right? And then we can use this uh, to help us with program analysis, malware detection, scheduling techniques, and uh, among others, all right? So I would like to thank uh, my current and previous uh, students, Judy Tab, Xander, and uh, uh, James, as well as Dr. Torres and Dr. Young, who graduated already, and uh, then, uh, See, this is uh, our selected uh, publications uh, along this topic uh, for interested uh, uh, audience. And uh, uh, this concludes my presentation. I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Uh, we have different questions in the chat, so I will uh, start to read them and you can answer them.